Good morning, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me loud and clear. Welcome to the Forestry Commission uh, Plant Health webinar on Phytophthora pluvialis. Um, for the next hour, you'll be hearing from a range of um, very knowledgeable experts on the topic. Um, we will um, run you through the disease, how we found it in the first place. We'll give you the signs and symptoms and diagnosis. We'll talk about the demarcation zones and the plant health notices that are required in the areas where it is present. And we will then wrap up with talk about biosecurity, so how we as an industry can help prevent the spread. So yeah, I've got four great speakers lined up for you. We'll be running a Q&A um, through and whatever time we have left at the end of the hour, we will answer the questions. You should see a Q&A function if you type your question in there um, and we will uh, address those questions at the end. If you see a question that you like that you want answered, please put the, the sort of the thumbs up the like button for it because we will be addressing those questions that are most uh, responded to, most requested in the panel at the end. If we do have uh, any unanswered questions, we'll try to put together uh, a Q&A, uh, a written Q&A and we'll publish that afterwards. If you um, want to share this, we will be putting this uh, recording onto the Forestry Commission YouTube channel uh, where it will join the rest of the series of uh, plant health webinars. Uh, we've recently run them on Oak Processionary Moth and Ips Typographus. They're already online. This recording will join them and there's loads of other fantastic videos, presentations, webinars uh, and helpful videos on there as well. So um, if you want just general information, go to the Forestry Commission YouTube channel. OK, so that's enough from me. I would like to bring in uh, the first presenter. This is going to be Mick Biddle, the Tree Health Officer, who will explain a little bit more. So Mick, welcome to the talk. Over to you. Thanks, John. I'm just sharing my presentation. Hopefully that will come up for you. Could you just confirm that that's OK? Yeah, you should be on screen now for everyone, mate. OK. Hello, everyone. I'm Mick Biddle, um, Tree Health Officer for the South West for the Forestry Commission in the Plant Health Forestry team. I'm going to talk briefly uh, about, well, basically to set the scene, um, talk a bit about plant health in the South West. Um, we're talking about Phytophthora pluvialis today, so this will be how we first found it and um, and where, and then to talk about the enormous amount of survey and other work that's gone on since the finding um, or since the confirmation in, in September last year. Um, so before, and then after that, I'll hand over to Anna who can talk in detail about the actual um, pathogen itself and the signs and symptoms. So if I can try and move the slides along. Before I launch into it, I'll just um, give you an overview of what the plant health forestry team does. Um, this is our team remit here. We support healthy trees, woods and forests. And the, the three key areas that we that we tend to work on are preventing the entry of pests and diseases in the first place uh, where they do get through to provide this early detection. So we do a lot of survey work um, so that we're in the best possible position to detect things early and minimise their impact um, as and when they are found. And this early detection and the, the minimise, minimising impacts is um, very relevant to today's talk. So very brief overview of our team's role. To set the scene, um, I may well be teaching people to suck eggs here, but I'm going to go back to, to um, fairly basics to start with. Um, Phytophthora pluvialis is why we're here today. Um, the genus Phytophthora, for those of you who don't know, um, is a genus which contains some really nasty, damaging plant and tree pathogens. Um, many of you will be familiar with potato blight, that's a Phytophthora. Um, and those of you in the southwest will, with an interest in forestry will almost certainly have come across Phytophthora remorum, um, which has uh, been in, present in the southwest, affecting predominantly larch, but not limited to larch 
trees since 2010. Um, this particular um, Phytophthora, Phytophthora remorum, um, is capable of damaging a large range of trees and shrub species um, and habitat types, so woodlands, heathlands, ornamental gardens, and it's as a consequence, it's subject to statute, statutory control. Um, so there's um, uh, felling orders which are placed where infections are found. Um, and to give you some numbers, um, there's been around 6,300 hectares of larch affected from 2010 to 2000, 2000, end of 2020. Um, and about half of that um, is in southwest England. Um, and there is a program of annual aerial surveillance which is undertaken by our team, well, predominantly by helicopter, then followed up by ground surveys. Um, now it's worth saying that to, to put all of this in context that um, 2020 and 2021 have been our busiest ever years in terms of fight off the remorum nationwide. So um, although uh, the the new findings and the, the most impact has predominantly been in the north of England and the Midlands. Uh, the southwest in the last couple of years has been um, quite badly affected by Phytophthora remorum. Um, so this is a fairly typical site um, from last year's surveys. This is still looking at Larch and Phytophthora remorum. This is a picture of a site in North Devon. Obviously all those graying and uh, dying trees um, are uh, affected larch. Um, we also had hot spots of infection elsewhere, including Blackdown Hills. These pictures will look all too familiar to a lot of you, I'm sure. And over near Lyme Regis, West Dorset, we had a hot spot of infection there, predominantly on the Forestry England sites there, where all these larch were dying. Um, and it was during these aerial surveys where we flew over the Glynn Valley in Cornwall like we do all the time um, and picked up dieback in this stand of trees which didn't seem too unusual apart from the fact that um, all of the larch in this valley in Cornwall has been removed um, in about a decade previous to this and these trees were actually western hemlock um, and looking closer at them you could see that there was severe defoliation mortality occurring in these mature trees um, and got a brief bit of drone footage here which will hopefully play so it sort of speaks for itself in terms of the uh, level of damage on this particular site. Um, lots of defoliation, um, a bottom up sort of defoliation effect but you can see that there were trees that were dead and dying in this approximately five hectares stand. So you get the idea, lots of dead dying trees. Um, Anna Perez is going to talk about the symptoms in much more detail, but um, th this is what we found when we were on site. So uh, looking at this site straight away after it was found end of August, um, we found bleeding cankers on small branches and stems. Um, and at this stage, we were thinking it must be fight off the remorum because it's been a bad year. Um, we often find Western hemlock affected with Phytophthora remorum where it's an association with infected larch, but we we just couldn't understand where the where the inoculum source had come from, and we'd never seen anything on this on this scale before on this particular site. So we duly sent in samples to Anna Perez and her team, and that's when things got slightly strange because they confirmed not that there was well. They confirmed that fight off the remorum was not in the samples that we sent, but they did manage to detect Phytophthora pluvialis. And again, Anna will give more details on the actual pathogen itself, but it was really unusual because um, this Phytophthora has only ever been found before in Oregon and New Zealand, so um, different parts of the world, um, and also it's 
primarily in those areas a foliar pathogen causing problems in Douglas fir and radiata pine. Um, and there'd been no um, recorded findings on, on Western hemlock, let alone any findings of any serious stem cankers or mortality. Um, so there are a lot of questions, and at this stage there were even more questions, but there are um, there are still a lot of unanswered questions, um, and we are working to try to answer as many of these as quickly as we can. Um, again, Anna will talk more about some of the research work which is going on. So then things then began to move quite quickly. Um, uh, an incident management team was convened um, and we initiated five kilometre radius surveys around uh, around the, the site. Further aerial surveys were also undertaken and more follow up ground surveys um, were done, um, as you would think, uh, concentrating on Western Hemlock and, and Douglas fir. Uh, at a similar sort of time, further reports um, were uh, confirmed in Cumbria, so right up in the Lake District. Um, and at, at around that time as well, on this site, in on a couple of the sites, there were also findings made in Douglas fir, um, although um, again, Anna will show you pictures and things of this and talk about this later. But generally speaking, the damage in the Douglas fir is is far less than um, has been seen in the Western Hemlock. And we've only found the infection in Douglas fir in association with where we have infected Western Hemlock. So generally right next to heavily infected Hemlock. We also did proactive surveys. Over a thousand sites were looked at predominantly on the Forestry England estate, um, looking at Western Hemlock and Douglas fir sites. Um, and more sites were looked at in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. Um, this incident management team was made a sort of UK wide incident team. Um, and the result of all these surveys were that there were findings in four more areas in Devon and um, these two findings up in Cumbria and then more recently a individual finding over in Surrey. There were also findings, there have also been findings um, up in Wales, um, through Wales and in northern and western Scotland. So immediately quite a large distribution um, after this initial work. Now it must be said that generally these sites where we've got these red dots the the level of damage has been quite low um, and almost always adjacent to roads or watercourses or corridors um, of some description. This is a case um, in point really. It's an example of a otherwise perfectly healthy looking bit of Western Hemlock regen adjacent to a forest road with one single branch, um, small branch with with dieback, um, which has subsequently proven to be a positive um, for Phytophthora pluvialis. Um, uh, it's important to bear this in mind when um, talking about the, 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 um, the rest of the presentation, because I know Anna will show you lots of pictures of symptoms, which is great, but it's worth bearing in mind that a lot of the symptoms are extremely subtle um, and may have been there, would have otherwise gone unnoticed, I think, if we weren't specifically going out looking for it. Um, in terms of statutory work, um, which has been undertaken to date, that five hectare stand of um, 1959 Western Hemlock has been felled and the material is at roadside um, awaiting um, a, a method that it can be removed in a biosecure, moved from the site in a biosecure way. Um, it's pending research, which is ongoing um, into how much of a risk these this material actually poses. Um, in terms of the other sites which have been found, um, there's a site by site approach being adopted. Um, like I say, generally the sites are not as badly affected as this site. So the the idea is to um, try to do a management sort of approach and to remove trees or understory in corridors away from um, 
away from the, the features such as roads and watercourses where they where they've been found because generally the infection is quite close to the roads but doesn't extend um, up into the um, further into the um, stands and indeed in a lot of cases it's just restricted to regeneration or understory material and not affecting mature trees um, and all but one site including all of the Welsh and Scottish sites as well um, are in public ownership there's just one site near Exeter which is a very um, subtly infected site so there's very few symptoms there um, on a private estate near near Exeter but all of the other sites so far are on publicly owned land and then I'm just setting up uh, Will and Anna now for their presentations but that gives you an idea of the um, distribution that we're currently looking at these are demarcated areas which have been set up to contain um, uh, material and uh, there will be shortly another demarcated area coming online in Surrey in relation to the to the finding over there that I mentioned before. Um, and there is also a lot of research work and diagnostics work co constantly ongoing um, at the moment. So um, again, I'll let Anna talk about that. So hopefully that's me done. Um, I'll hand back to you, John, if that's all right. Great. Thank you very much, Mick. And thank you for doing my job lining up and whetting appetite for our, our next uh, uh, guest. Um, this is going to be Anna Perez Sierra from Forest Research. Forest Research are the government's forestry uh, scientists who do some world leading research. So, uh, yeah, Anna, if you're ready to take us through the signs and the symptoms of the actual disease, um, Great. Your your slideshow is um, yeah, there. We go in presenter mode. So thank you very much, Anna, for joining us. Over to you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, yes, and thank you, Mick, for the good introduction. Uh, I'm going to cover the symptoms, a uh, close up to the symptoms or caused by Phytophthora pluvialis. Um, let's see. Okay. Then. Oh. Yeah, sorry. Then uh, I think Mick showed you a video of this site. This was the during the aerial surveys, as Mick mentioned, uh, this site was detected with a decline or death of Western hemlock in, in Cornwall. Uh, we did follow up this uh, site uh, with the samples that they were collected by the three health officers and we knew it was not Ramorum, samples were tested for Ramorum, it was negative for Ramorum, then what is it? Then we did look for all different kinds of pathogens, uh, including maybe other Phytophthora species. And we, the, we did manage to isolate Phytophthora pluvialis from uh, some of the samples that they were first collected there. We confirm it this uh, by isolation on agar media. It's a picture there. You can see the phytophthora growing on media. We also uh, identify the pathogen by sequencing different regions uh, of the DNA and also by real time PCR um, because it was uh, a new pathogen detected in the country, not only in the country, the first detection in Europe. Uh, we did send the sample to be confirmed in another laboratory just to make sure that what we had was really Phytophthora pluvialis. Then uh, the, we sent samples of DNA to another laboratory and they confirmed, yes, this is pluvialis. Uh, immediately we got in touch with the countries where Phytophthora pluvialis is present and we are still collaborating with them uh, in different aspects that I will talk about it uh, at the end. Then Phytophthora pluvialis has been now detected in England, Scotland and Wales and mainly in two hosts, Western Hemlock and Douglas fir. And Douglas fir is a known host in other countries in the world where Phytophthora pluvialis exists. However, Western Hemlock was not. Then this was a new host for a Phytophthora species that was present in other countries but never affecting Western Hemlock. Then Let's see to the symptoms uh, observed on Western Hemlock. The first thing you are going to, to see in a mature stand 
is the bare lower branches. And as you can see in these photographs here, I don't know if you can say my cursor moving. I'm not sure if that can be seen or not. But you can see the lower branches uh, of, the, of the mature trees are gray or brown. Uh, the, the, the needles are, are lost. And this is the kind of effect you will see. The top of the tree, the top of the crown will be healthy. However, the lower branches will be bare. Maybe you can see it better in this picture. You can see the bare, the lower bare branches are uh, affected, but the top of the trees, they are green. And usually, as Mick mentioned, you see the very clear symptoms along the roads. Uh, again, more cases or more symptoms where you can see the lower bare branches, the top remains healthy. And here again, this is in the region. But the characteristic of this disease for us was the resinosis. The resin that the trees exud exudate when they are infected. And when you look to the infected trees, they have multiple resinous cankers. And I'm not talking about one or two, it's one next to each other. I mean, it's just unbelievable. In this picture, you can see on the left, one, two, three, four, five, or in the middle, you can see is one canker next to the other in all of them. This is very characteristic of this disease. Again, this is, you can see the cracking of the bark, the resin, even by touching the infected trees is sticky and resinous, even the needles. Um, you can see here the canker, lots of resin there. And when you remove the bark of the on this resinous area, you will see the dead cambium area under the bark. Uh, another sample, you can see the canker here, lots of fresh resin um, in the canker. And when you remove the bark, you see the characteristic uh, lesion into the cambium and into the floor of the trees uh, here. You can see it in there. These resinous cankers, we observe them in, in, in branches, but also on the main stem. These are the main stem of some of the region and some of the branches. You can see again uh, is the resinosis, the depressed lesions, like you can see in this picture here, and the exudation of resin. When you remove the bark, again, you can see the lesion under the bark. In every single case, you will have a lesion into the cambium and phloem area, as you can see in these photographs. But we also found the lesions on the uh, base of the stems, basal lesions. And here is an example with a massive uh, exudation of resin, as you can see on the picture on your, on your left. Um, and you have another one, uh, the lesion on the base of the mature tree uh, at the base of the stem. In some cases, you may find, when you find this resin flow at the base of the trees, you may find that armillaria honey fungus may be present. But under or beyond the honey fungus, you will find that Phytophthora is there. Then it's worth to check always when you have this uh, uh, resin to see if you have armillaria and uh, it beyond the lesion caused by armillaria, if you have also Phytophthora, this is very important. What about symptoms in foliage? Uh, in the foliage, uh, it is the needles that can be bright green in color, they turn olive green. It's quite difficult to see in here. If I ask you, can you see the, the needles in here? They are there and maybe you can see them better in here. They turn an olive green color and this is how you detect them. Maybe you can see it better here. It's quite easy to distinguish the color, the green color and the off green color. What about Douglas fir? On Douglas fir, we have similar symptoms. We have the base of the tree become uh, bare, as you can see here. Um, you can see a severe case in the picture on the right, where you see the defoliation of the lower branches. These are infected Douglas next to infected hemlock. Uh, trees. Also, you have cankers on Douglas fir, and these are the cankers you can see. You have the resinosis and the cankers on Douglas fir. 
Uh, very interesting what we did observe on Douglas fir, and we also have now observed on Western hemlock, is that some of these cankers, they seem to be healing over or callusing, callusing over. And this is very clear in these photographs. You can see the part that is affected by Phytophthora pluvialis, but you can see the healthy tissue that is trying to callus over the infected point. You can see it here, one lesion next to the other, but trying to heal over. And here in the in the picture on the bottom, you can see where the bark is trying to be lifted from the hilly, healed area. These are also some of the old cankers on Douglas fir, and you can see how the tree is trying to respond by healing over the infection. The lesions on needles Again, you will see that the needles turn from green to olive green color, and you can see them here. It's very difficult and very subtle sometimes to see it, but you can see it in here. And um, these are the symptoms we have observed, as I said, only two hosts, Western Hemlock, Douglas fir. This is, the, as it was the first detection in Western Hemlock, we needed to prove that actually this was the cause of the symptoms observed in the field. And that has been now published. And uh, we know that the symptoms we observed on Western hemlock were caused by Phytophthora pluvialis, because this was the first published detection of this pathogen on Western hemlock in the world. Any information on, um, on Phytophthora pluvialis you can follow on the government pages. And just to let you know where where else is this uh, this Phytophthora present is quite interesting. You have it on the uh, US and New Zealand and here as in the middle. Very interesting map because if I look at it, I think, is it really like that or how, is it present in other places in between and hasn't been detected? Uh, but this is where it is present at the moment. And just to let you know what is doing in other countries. In the US, Phytophthora pluvialis is, uh, has been detected on Tan Oak and on Douglas fir, and in New Zealand, mainly on Radiata pine, but also other pine species and Douglas fir. And it is described as uh, the disease as red needle cast. It's basically a foliar pathogen. The situation in Britain is that we have Western hemlock and Douglas fir, and in our case, definitely it is as well a foliar uh, a needle pathogen, but also a canker pathogen. Uh, we are doing some research uh, to, to look to the origin of Phytophthora pluvialis and also some research to see when it colonizes the bark, uh, how deep goes into the xylem, then we can recommend the best action uh, when doing management. We also look into the susceptibility of other tree species to Phytophthora pluvialis. As I said, Western hemlock was a new host. Then, do we have any other susceptible species in the country? Then we are working on that as well. We are doing monitoring on of the pathogen on affected sites. We are we have rainwater traps where we monitor the inoculum. We are doing a stream baiting to monitor if it is present in the water streams, and we are also testing samples. Then uh, I think I will leave it here. I think I gave you a, a clear vision of, of the symptoms and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, really interesting talk and I just re would reflect for a moment what an incredible feat it is by you and your team to find a disease never seen before in this country acting in a way that has not been seen anywhere else in the world and you within a month or two managed to identify it and have a name and a knowledge of that that i mean it's we are so lucky to have people like you working in forest research so thank you very much um the next talk is going to be from will tompkins who's the regional manager for the plant health team uh, he's going to discuss what we have to do, how we're managing the infection and, and how it affects the timber industry. So, Will, if you are ready, please uh, take it away. Thanks, John. Can you see that OK? Yeah, that's uh, yeah, cool. That's good. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I'm afraid this is a bit of a drier presentation than I know the mixed, exciting picture filled presentation, but I've tried to lay it out as a bit of a guide for what to do. So um, I will make it available for people afterwards if they want it. 
um, and I'll rattle through it relatively quickly. So <clears throat> how we control the uh, DMAs is through the uh, implementation of movement and processor authorizations, and that's run by us at Plant Health. Um, and that is related to, as an example, the Southwest notice, which most a lot of you will now be familiar with, I'm sure. The initial findings down in the Southwest and the subsequent uh, demarcated area came out of that. Um, that was put in place after UK Plant Health Risk Group did a risk assessment on pluvialis, concluded that it was uh, a, a disease for um, uh, that it was considered a quarantine disease. So to protect this, protect the uh, protect England from the disease, they've imposed the DMA system that we're using. And within that system, there's restrictions then on timber movement and processing. So I think it's important to flag up that um, uh, where the information is, as Anna alluded to, uh, on the .gov pages, uh, the link to the latest notice is there. Uh, I think it's nine now, um, it might be eight. And that also sets out the background to the legislation that informs these decisions, which is, if anyone's interested in that, then it's there for you to see. Um, so, I'll talk initially about the movement authorizations and how they work. <clears throat> now, this is a way, really, of um, uh, us tracking material in the DMA, where it leaves the DMA, and where it's come from. Uh, within the DMA, which site and where it's gone to. So if a subsequent issue arises, we can trace where potential materials come from. <clears throat> so this is all outlined on the pages, on the web pages, but I'll just briefly run through it. You must give 14 days notice of harvesting operations. If the material is moving off site, then a movement authorization will be required and it must go to an authorized processor. Movement authorizations can be obtained through contacting our team and the email address is there. Um, and they uh, they respond pretty quickly. Who needs to apply for these authorizations? Anyone felling susceptible species, host species in the DMA, so Douglas fir, etc. This also includes, and this can catch people out sometimes, licenses and management plans that are in place and have been approved prior to the creation of the DMA. So the risk of infection is still there because these sites are in the DMA. And, and if, they're, if they're of the host species, then we need to be informed that they're being felled. Uh, also, our, our boricultural works, so any tree surgery stuff of, um, within the DMA also needs to be notified to us. And uh, yeah, that's that's worth noting if you're doing roadside work or uh, felling trees and on private property, etc. So how does the process work? Essentially, we ask for a series of information from you. That information is then fed into our contract inspector. Uh, we will respond hopefully within two days to your inquiry, because we're aware that a 14 day turnaround is a bit of a worry for people. So <clears throat> we're not trying to block uh, the industry from carrying on, in fact, trying to help. So we do try and respond within two days on the email, and then an inspector is sent to site once we've received that information outlined there, and they'll try and get there within two weeks. Okay, so. Uh, that hopefully will give people the confidence that we are responding to things as we find them and that we're here to help you facilitate works rather than get in the way. Um, providing there's no suspicious symptoms, then the authorization will be issued verbally on the day by the inspector and confirmation letter with a unique reference number will be issued by our team at uh, Bucket Base. Um, each authorization is valid for six months, and that reflects the risk of reinfect uh, possible future infection, not reinfection, sorry, future infection. Uh, and it also, so if you've got an uh, ongoing wooden management plan, then yes, every time, every six months, you would have to apply for a movement authorization inspection. Um, obviously, these aren't a cost 
to the industry. These are funded by us and, and this is a, a way that we're trying to work with people to get to keep things wrong over as smoothly as possible. Um, each movement authorization is issued by site, so it's not it's not that uh, each individual harvesting site, sorry. So it's not that one woodland will receive a movement authorization and it covers the whole woodland. It's by, if you like, compartment. So if you've got uh, one compartment of Douglas fir that you're felling in the next few months, that one will get a movement authorization. That movement authorization is only relevant to this, the site that is inspected on the day that the plant health inspector is there. So it's fine to inspect more than one compartment. We can, we can build quite elaborate inspection programs but it's only the movement authorization is only relevant to the stuff to the material that the inspector sees. <clears throat> if symptoms are found, no authorization will be issued. Uh, it is likely that someone like Mick will come along and do further, well, hopefully, or Ben will do further surveying and samples will be sent to Anna Forest Research to, for confirmation. If a site is found to be infected, then an SPHN will be issued and that will have uh, site specific biosecurity um, conditions in it, depending on level of infection, um, location of site, etc. Uh, those are sort of bespoke documents that um, I can't really give you a general overview of that come kind of specific to each individual case. Um, if it's once it's come back from forest research, any samples and it's found not to be infected, then a movement authorization can be issued. And also in relation to the SPHN, uh, once those biosecurity conditions are met to the satisfaction, then a movement authorization may be issued to any timber res from resulting activities. <clears throat> Currently in England, there are 67 processors authorised to take non-infected material from the DMA. Uh, this number is growing all the time and um, we endeavour to update the website to make sure that uh, everyone is on there and that some people aren't left off um, because obviously there's business implications for that if people are going to this to this website for information. Um, contact us the same way as you would for a movement authorization if you want to become an authorized processor there are in, there are around infected timber there are still unknowns as to the level of infection and uh how and whether or not material can be deemed as clear, clear of infection after sawmill in process which is still being researched so at the moment we're restricted in who, which processes can become authorised for infected material. Um, but that will become apparent in the near future, hopefully. There's various research and stuff going on around that, which um, which uh, will be updated as, as it becomes clearer. Um, the basis of how we operate around uh, pluvialis authorizations is outlined in this document, which also includes all the requirements for movement authorization and processor authorization from the applicant. Um, <clears throat> this document isn't on the website, but I'm happy to share this with people if they want to contact me or the pluvialis team. It does lay out uh, quite comprehensively what you need to do, what's required of you. And in fact, if you apply to become an authorised processor, then it's part of the uh, application process, you receive the document. Um, it also outlines what is considered to, which timber is considered to be free of infection. And that's, uh, <clears throat> although it's not confirmed for infected sites, um, it's square sawn and square edged boards uh, heat treated solid woods treated at 56 degrees for more than 30 minutes. Heat treated chip wood treated at 56 degrees for more than 30 minutes. Solid or chip wood with reduced moisture content of 20% or less. Wood with or without bark treated by fumigation. And then there's some, there are some nuances around fencing products where timber is treated with a wood, uh, pressure treated with a preservative. Um, <clears throat> So there is there are there is flexibility in the phytosanitary requirements 
if that makes sense. So I would think reading off that list initially, I would think if something is if if something is 20% moisture or less, then it's considered clear of infection. And I'm absolutely happy for anyone who's got any questions after this to drop me an email and I'll endeavour to answer them the best I can. This is can seem a complex area. Probably my waffling presentation hasn't done much to clear that up, but I'm happy to share any of the information, etc. I've talked about in in this presentation with people. And if 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 you if you if you want to become authorised as a processor or you have a need for movement authorization, then um, please get in touch. And that's me. Thanks, John. Thank you very much, Will. Uh, it's a really difficult job you've got there to keep the timber industry moving, but also to protect uh, the uninfected sites. So, yeah, I don't envy you that job at all. But uh, yeah, thank you and the team for all the hard work you do. And just to, um, if anyone didn't catch Will's email there, we will be sending round a sort of a, a follow up. Um, after this, which will have um, a, a questionnaire as well to sort of anything you want to know about uh, any other webinars that you think the Forestry Commission could host. Um, and we can put some of the contact details for the, for the relevant teams in there. And just a quick reminder before we move on to, to Freddie for the final part of the talk, um, if there is a question that you see in the Q&A that you would like to see answered, please put the, the like, the thumbs up sign, and we'll try and answer the questions that have the most uh, requests in the end. So do just, just have a little scan at those. Um, now moving over to, to Freddie Toff, the biosecurity officer, um, who will discuss how we can all help to stop the onward spread of infection. So Freddie, if you're ready, over to you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Hopefully you can see that if someone can confirm my slides. Yeah, well. that's coming across well, Freddie. That's great. Thanks, John. So good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Fred Toff from Forestry Commission. I'm one of their biosecurity officers. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about um, some of the, the procedures and methods you can use to prevent not only the spread of Phytophthora pluvialis, but also other pest diseases and, and invasive non-native species. Firstly, just going to mention that good biosecurity practice never assumes a site to be, to be free from a, a biosecurity threat. Um, so as a biosecurity threat, um, referring to a pest or a disease or an invasive non-native species. Um, so first example here is ash dieback, um, discovered in the UK in 2011. However, there is there's evidence to, to indicate that it actually arrived before 2003. The second example here is a Phytophthora remorum site, um, one of the earlier sites where remorum was discovered in 2009. The soil was subsequently sampled um, up until 2019, where it was uh, still found to be alive in the soil there. No sporulating hosts were present, Phytophthora was still alive in the soil there. And finally, Phytophthora pluvialis um, discovered last year, September 2001. But when did it arrive? Uh, we just don't know. Um, so you can never assume a site that you're working on or traveling between to be deemed clean or, or free from uh, biosecurity threats. Um, so what equipment do you need to undertake personal biosecurity? So personal biosecurity relating to your equipment, your clothing, your boots, and, and your transportation. Um, it's a very simple bit of kit, and it can come in all shapes and sizes and forms, but essentially it's a, a brush, a, a, a boot pick, or something to pick stones out of boots, a, a water container um, large enough to, to contain the amount of water you need for your, your, your planned activities, and, and a bucket. Um, and that is the bare bones of a personal biosecurity kit. Of course, on, on top of that, there is the consideration of, of disinfectant. However, if you um, clean your boots and equipment um, with water, you, you're doing 99% of, of the biosecurity. Disinfectant is, is the cherry on top of, of the cake, and, and of course it, it's ideally used between site visits, but washing with water and removing um, organic material, soil and mud um, from your boots and clothing is, is the majority of the biosecurity, your personal biosecurity. And this equipment is, is, is very cheap, you know, £25 for, for a kit. And the lifetime of this equipment is, you know, 
forever if you look after it. It's modern materials, it's, it's going to last a long time. Um, so some considerations to take into account when, when choosing your kit. Um, if you are going to buy a new pair of boots, um, consider um, the thickness of the boot tread. You know, a, a, a more widely spaced boot tread will be easier to clean and make this job um, biosecurity as easy as possible. Secondly, if you're buying a bucket to um, as part of your biosecurity kit, ensuring that the, the bucket or the container is, is large enough to, to put your boot into or to submerge your boot in. Um, thirdly here um, is uh, considering buying a long handled plastic brush. Um, anyone who's out there doing biosecurity every day when they move between sites um, in the winter can, can tell you that a long handled plastic brush is, is 100 times better than, than one with a short handle. Um, keeps your hands dry in, in the winter and therefore warm, but also it prevents you know, splashbacks when you are cleaning your boots and, and keeps you away from, from any um, nasty materials that, that may be on your boots. Um, and finally, if you are um, heading to a lot of sites throughout your day and, and you are undertaking biosecurity um, every time you, you, you change sites, you might want to consider purchasing a, uh, a battery powered pressure washer or, or one with a 12 volt charger. It makes the job quick and easy. Um, so some common personal biosecurity mistakes that we see people in the field doing all the time. Um, firstly, it's trying to clean your boots while still wearing them. Um, ideally, when you um, get back to your transportation or your vehicle, the best thing to do is have a clean pair of trainers in the car to, that you can drive in um, and then put these on, so removing the, your dirty boots and then having a bucket large enough to submerge them in and, and wash them whilst they're off your feet. Makes the job easier and also means you can see your whole boot clearly. Secondly, and this is probably one of the biggest mistakes and waste of time and money that we see people doing, is spraying disinfectant on muddy boots. Um, you might think this is, the, you know, I'm doing a good job and putting disinfectant on, but it's it's a waste of time and money and your disinfectant. Disinfectant is easily inactivated on contact with organic material. So disinfectant is only effective if sprayed onto a freshly cleaned boot. Thirdly here, it's, it's not dislodging stones from boots. That's why we recommend people having some sort of boot pick um, in their biosecurity kit. And, and finally, it's um, um, pouring wastewater down a drain or, or near a water course. You know, this can exacerbate the problems of Phytophthora. Um, ideally, what you should do is, is pour wastewater onto some sort of hard standing on the site that you visited, um, away from areas of, of high footfall. Um, therefore, the water will just naturally evaporate and anything which is, has been picked up on site is then left on the site where it's been picked up on. Um, so there are considerations to, to take uh, into account um, when planning your, your site visits. Um, most people visit multiple sites in a day, um, so having some planning in place um, as a biosecurity considerations relating to this um, will help prevent the spread of, of pests and diseases. Um, firstly, determine whether the visit is necessary, and most of the time, of course, the visit is going to be necessary, but if you are meeting someone to discuss um, certain aspects, could you meet them away from site or online? Um, if, can you plan the, the site visit order? Um, so the higher risk sites or sites where you know a, uh, a pest or disease is present are visited last in order so the, the spread of those pests and diseases is limited. Can you contact the, the site owner or manager? as you would with um, health and safety um, questions. Can you ask, are there areas of the site um, which are higher risk or areas of the site where there may have been reports of a, uh, a pest or a disease or some sort of other um, invasive non-native species? And of course, preparing a biosecurity kit with enough supplies to last for your, your whole day planned activities. On arrival to site, um, whatever site you're visiting, um, consider where you park. Um, so your vehicle um, can pick up pests and diseases as well as your boots and clothing. So the best place to park is, is away from site on hard standing um, or in a designated car park. Um, and this parking location um, should be treated as, as, as kind of your biosecurity base 
Um, and again, this should be 10 metres away from a water course, so any wastewater that you have at the end of your visit can be discarded appropriately. If you are taking samples, um, handle them responsibly, putting them in a, in a Ziploc bag, and after taking samples, making sure your hands are clean um, with some sort of antibacterial hand gel or, or washing them with water. And of course, leave clean um, is, the, is the key thing, and also, of course, arrive clean as well. And finally, um, once you are finished, ensure that the, before you head to your next site, you have enough water and disinfectant um, in your supplies. Um, and anything that you may have seen on site is reported, so any biosecurity threats are, are reported. And the majority of the time, um, as we all work with trees here, you'll want to report it through Tree Alert, which will go through to Anna's team. Um, it's a very useful tool, incredibly easy to use, um, and there's just um, some small bits of information which are required. Um, so information about yourself, um, your name and a valid email address so you can get a response. And then this is some information about your observation. So the type of location it is, um, a handy drop down list is, is provided here, um, a location and ideally this should be at least a 10 figure grid reference. Um, however, if you weren't able to grab a grid reference for whatever reason, um, there is a map with, where you can drop a pin, which is very useful as well. The number of trees that are affected and their size, um, again, a guide is provided for this. Um, and then the type of tree, the conifer or broadleaf, and then common name if you know it, or the species. Um, and again, drop down lists are provided here. And then just information about whatever problem you've seen, um, location on the tree, um, the nature of the symptom, um, and very conveniently, you can report more than one symptom on, a, on any affected tree. But the most important thing to record when you have seen something in the field um, are at least three good quality photographs. Um, here we have an example of oak processionary moth. So we have the first photograph there on the left um, is, is an oak tree um, in context. Um, and there you can see some subtle defoliation in the upper canopy. We then have uh, a photograph of the symptoms in context. So the middle photograph there, we have a silken trail leading to a silken nest and then a photograph um, of the symptoms up close. Um, so please, if you are submitting any report, report, reports to Tree Alert, ensure that you take at least three good quality photographs um, and follow in this, this procedure. One in context, one with the symptoms in context, and then one of the, the symptoms close up. And that just means that you're gonna get a, a, a quicker reply and also a, a more detailed reply because the, the team at the, at, in Anna's, and his team will be able to be actually analyze these photographs um, easier. Um, and thank you for listening. And hopefully there's one thing you can take. It's um, to keep it clean and don't give your tree pests and diseases an easy ride. Thank you, Freddie. Freddie. Yeah, really important to remind people, you know, we've got a personal responsibility in this um, and it's good to set a good example for us in the industry and be seen to be doing the right thing so members of the public get an idea um, of what they can be doing even if they're not quite as informed and detailed as we all are. Okay so we're going to move now to the last uh, few minutes to the the question and answer. Um, I'm just going to have a very quick scan through. Uh, there's one here. Uh, start if the panel could just pop their cameras on and if you would like to answer the question just lift your hand I can see you and then I can I can call you in. Um, so this is a question from Jen. Where a risk is identified under the Highways Act and a landowner is responsible for removing the risk, where the tree species is identified as either Douglas fir or Western hemlock, is it the responsibility of the local authority or the landowner to notify? Now that's quite a technical one and if if none of the panel feel able to tackle that one, that is one I can pass to different members of the team um, who are responsible for that. So does anyone brave enough to want to tackle that one? Mick, are your thank you and, and brave man. I, I put a um I replied to that in the chat, so I don't know if that has oh. in the Q and A. So I don't know if it has come up as an answer. Um but but basically my answer is I'm not hundred percent sure, but I, I suspect the responsibilities with the landowner. Um but uh 
we would be grateful for in that scenario if the local authority let us know to be sure, I guess. Thank you. And I see Will's hand is also up, so. Yeah, whoever's carrying out the work notifies us. Great, thank you. That's that's pretty clear. Um, oh, now I'm, I'm seeing your answers now, Mick, so uh, I'll try and find one that doesn't already have an answer. Uh, so I think this is one for you, Anna. Um, it's coming from a from someone who seems to be dialing in from Poland, which is great to know that we're having worldwide um, research. Uh, I agree with Anna. It is very interesting that pluvialis has only been confirmed in a few places so far. I wanted to know if you have any information on a potential threat to other conifers, such as Scots pine. I work with Phytophthora in Poland, where Scots pine is the dominant species, about 67% of all forests. And I wonder if the potential appearance of this species could be dangerous for us. So probably can't answer directly, Anna, but just have a have a stab at that one. Yes, uh, it, it, Scots pine is our one of our main concerns as well, because obviously Scots pine is our one of our native conifers here. And we are just uh, doing some uh, studies to look to the susceptibility of the main conifer species in, in Europe, because we don't know. Western hemlock, as I said, was a, a new a new host. Uh, then is there any other new hosts that we don't know yet? Then, as soon as anything, if we find anything uh, related to susceptibility of other conifer species, we will be putting all the information in the government pages. But yes, we are working on it. I also, I wanted to say because um, we we are working in close relation with uh, our colleagues in New Zealand and the US on on this because they have the same issue there, and it's thanks especially to the to the group in New Zealand they, that they provided us with a methodology to detect the pathogen. It's a method that has not been published, but I really would like to say that it's thank you to them that we have been able to do all the work that we are doing on the detection. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. I think the next questions probably going to be for you as well. Um, is it known if Pluvialis has sporulating and terminal hosts like Remoran? OK, the answer is no. Uh, it's described in the US and New Zealand as a foliar pathogen. They never, they have seen in some cases like a uh, tweak uh, dieback, but they have not seen what we are seeing here, like uh, the cankers on the trees. Then potentially uh, we could have uh, that the, um, the situation where the pathogen once affects the bark, it doesn't move any further, but we don't know yet. We don't know if the fun, if the if Phytophthora pluvialis is able to sporulate on on the bark. I have to say that uh, when the pathogen was detected in New Zealand, they did look uh, the sporulation of the pathogen in timber, uh, because obviously for them radiata pine is an important crop and obviously they do exports. And they said it was not a sporulation on the bark, uh, but as I said, in there the pathogen was only affecting the needles, not the bark. Then, as I said, even that is the same pathogen, we still need to do a lot of research in this country uh, because we see this pathogen behaving in a different way then we don't know. That is the answer I have to say at the moment. <laughs> Great, thank you. And I think we've got time for one more question now, um, which is, would it be possible to prune out the disease if caught early enough? It's probably back to you, Anna. I mean, maybe just reflecting on other phytophthoras and how they and how they work through the trees. Uh, I think will be quite difficult, especially with a host like Western Hemlock, where you have uh, uh, so many needles that they can be uh, initiating new infections. Uh, I think also the symptoms are quite cryptic uh, in some cases. Then you may not be able to, by the time probably you see the severe symptoms, it's too late, if, if that makes sense uh, to, to do these kind of actions. 
Great, thank you. And also, yeah, just the practicalities of trying to just snip off branches. I think it would it'd be safer just to fell the tree um, if, if you have those specs. Right, so thank you. We're, we're coming close to the hour now, so I will just take this last minute to once again thank our fantastic guests, uh, Mick Biddle, Anna Perez, Sierra, Will Tompkins and Freddie Toft. Um, there will be a couple more of um, webinars in this Forestry Commission series, but as I said at the start, the ones we've already run are on the Forestry Commission YouTube channel. So do dial in to that. We will be sending round, um, hopefully, a, just a, a short written Q&A of any questions we didn't have time to get to. Um, but if there's one thing that you can take away from this is if you have any questions or concerns, please get in touch with us here at the Forestry Commission and Forest Research. Um, if very, you know, there's a lot of people here, there's a lot of knowledge, and we all have our specialists. And so if we can't answer it, we can certainly find someone who will be able to help. Um, so thank you all very, very much for, for, for listening to us. Um, hopefully we've given you a little bit of reassurance about all the work that goes on behind the scenes to, to keep the, uh, the, our forests safe and healthy and resilient for the future. And a massive thank you to all our guests. Have a great day, everyone. Goodbye. Bye.